Good afternoon, everyone, at least in the UK. Um, we're still being joined by a few people. We're over uh, 70 participants now, but uh, I can see that there are still people joining. So we'll give people a couple of minutes to join. I'll say a few introductory words, and then I'll hand over to uh, Jo and her colleagues who will uh, kick off the workshop. While we're waiting for everybody to join, um, could you, into the chat, just introduce yourself, say who you are, what university you're from, and what you're particularly interested in learning about today, is because then that will allow me and Nicholas and Justin to look at some of your particular questions and think about how we can pull that out as we're speaking. So everyone who's here today, just have a go at saying who you are, where you're coming in from today, and, and what you particularly like to learn about. Thank you so much. So the number of people joining has started to slow down slightly. So I will make a start. Thank you again for joining us today. And as Joe said a moment ago, if you joined after she said that, if you could just pop into the chat who you are, where you're from, and what you're interested in learning about today, that will um, be a nice way of us all introducing ourselves, but also will help to shape the conversation that we have after um, uh, after the discussion. So the um, the focus today is on online research and the data and data security considerations around that. This is an interesting intersection of two issues that are very relevant to the UK Reproducibility Network's work. This is one of our ongoing um, series of online workshops that cover a broad range of topics. Open research is a big part of, of what we do, but of course sh sharing data and other um, intermediate research artifacts like code and materials needs to be done well, needs to be done safely. And this workshop will, uh, will obviously um, go into those issues in some detail. And online research, which Gorilla supports, is something that has become increasingly important over the last two years, given the constraints imposed by the pandemic. So um, as well as this being a potentially efficient way to collect data at scale and achieve the sample sizes that are necessary to produce robust research, it's also something that has been increasingly um, essential for many research um, disciplines over the last two years. So today we've got three speakers. Nicholas will um, be setting the ethical and legal framing using online data more generally and just setting the scene for what will then um, follow from that. Justin will talk about um, the different university requirements, how stringent they are, why they're important, what's at stake if, if we get aspects of, uh, of this wrong. And Joe will then be talking about practical steps to help make good choices, navigate university bureaucracy, get online quickly and safely, in other words, getting it done. So we're going to go from setting the scene to what's at stake to then getting it done. And, uh, and that's the, the narrative arc across the three speakers. And then there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers um, at the end. And what you put into the chat can inform that Q&A afterwards. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you again to Nicholas, Justin and Joe for uh, agreeing to give these presentations. And as ever, thanks to Will, the UKRN administrator, for making all of this happen and to yourselves for joining us. So I think I've thanked pretty much everybody. And at that point, I'll hand over to Nicholas. OK, thank you very much. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so, yes. Uh, Thank you for coming uh, and thanks also to Jo um, and her colleagues for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, I'm an associate professor in computer science at UCL uh, and my research interests cover software engineering, computer music and research ethics, so quite an interdisciplinary mix. Uh, I'm a member of our department's research ethics committee, I serve and advise from time to time on the main UCL research ethics committee uh, and then more generally I'm the lead ethics officer for the new interfaces of musical expression conference series uh, and I've worked on the ethics supplements for the ACM paper and peer review quality initiative standards. Uh, and I've also published on uh, the research ethics uh, software mining with one of my colleagues uh, and I've written some guidance document documents for the REC. So, uh, and a lot of the work I do in our department is focused on talk course uh, project ethics. Uh, and so that happens at quite a lot of scale. We have a lot of projects. Uh, so we see a lot of different things. 
So I'm going to talk here about uh, research ethics issues with online data in fairly general terms. I'm going to give a couple of examples uh, as well uh, of where we can sort of look at specific specific issues. Um, before I get into that, just to give some what I've called scope and context, but I guess you could call it a disclaimer really. Um, so the presentation I'm giving here is based on uh, my reading of terms and conditions of various websites and such like as I see them at present, but of course these change. Um, as do society's positions on what is considered ethical. Uh, and so there's a constant evolution in the context of ethics evaluation. So I'm gonna try and stick to long-term broad principles and debates here, um, but it is worth noting that if you are, I guess, watching this in the future, some things may have changed by that point. Uh, I'm not gonna make any particular reference to an oversight regime or policy in terms of which specific REC or IRB or the commercial equivalent thereof uh, is relevant. Um, but it is important to recognise that organisations have different arrangements and policies and risk appetites. And so whatever I'm talking about here always will need to be subject to your local oversight arrangements. So if you're taking this as, as uh, help to try and think about the ethics issues, that's, that's great. But you're working in your policy and practice context um, and, and obviously it needs to fit within that. In addition to the differences in oversight, each research investigation is different and has different nuances. So. Uh, it's very important to have uh, a sensitivity to the particular issues that arise in each situation. Uh, I'm often asked if there's a checklist for ethics, and I think that's very challenging because uh, everything is a constantly changing and slightly different thing. So there are, there are guidelines one can have um, in terms of the kinds of questions one can ask, but in terms of the kind of steps one needs to go through, um, checklists get you so far, but they don't necessarily give you the full answer. Um, and Markham's paper on this is very good, this uh, method is ethic, ethic is method, uh, suggesting that decisions about methods are in fact decisions about ethics and vice versa. So the two things are constantly linked. Um, and finally, just to say, I'm not going to discuss legal issues very much. They are, they do very much impinge on this. We're going to look at them in terms of how they inform ethical decision making. Um, but others here, you know, my, my colleagues speaking today have a far better qualified to speak on that. I am not a lawyer, don't treat anything I say as legal advice. Okay, that's, so there we are, that's the disclaimers, let's get on with the, uh, with the rest of it. So I want to talk about some big picture issues and then I'm gonna talk about a couple of examples. And this is really about the issues that online data uh, can create for researchers. Uh, typically I'm thinking here, perhaps a bit more about secondary data than primary, although as we'll see the boundary between those is actually quite blurred in places. Uh, and how one can both address the issues and then discuss them with oversight bodies like research ethics committees. Um, and naturally, of course, this is, this is just not just me on my own. This is work I do with colleagues uh, at UCL and around the world. And I'm uh, very grateful uh, to all of them for the, uh, the discussions we have and how that's, how that's shaping the thinking. So let's start with what I term private data on public display. So the world has a lot of accessible data. Uh, there is genuinely public data, so things that have been published uh, or have been put explicitly in the public domain. There's a lot of other data that is available under contractual terms of access. Uh, and this data is provided under different understandings and expectations of what will happen to it. Um, so uh, Segura and, and colleagues document their experience with this and they survey the evidence as well on, on uh, different understandings of public and private spaces on the internet. Uh, one of the things they notice is that it's very hard to show that users are actually aware of the public nature of their contributions and that just because a conversation is happening in a public space that doesn't mean that the content itself should necessarily be regarded as public. Um, I guess an analogy for this might be uh, if you're sitting in a coffee shop and you overhear somebody's conversation. Yes the conversation is happening in an ostensibly public space but that doesn't necessarily mean as a researcher that it's appropriate to start making notes on it and, and to investigate that. And I'll come back, I'll put another analogy for that in a minute. So from an, from an ethics review standpoint, being able to show or at least argue that it's reasonable to expect that people understand the public nature of what they're doing um, is a sort of important part, I think, of justifying things like waivers from the kind of the bedrock ethics issues like informed consent, uh, where there may be countervailing considerations of, of practicality. So, we have this, this kind of private data on public display, if you like, that, that is often regarded as if it were completely public and very easy to access. But we'll see that there are differences between what we might think of as legitimate availability and technical availability. 
uh, and these issues of expectation, consent, contract regulation, access, these all come into the, the ethical case that we have to build. Um, and so whilst online sources of, of secondary data look like very straightforward, low effort sources for investigations and so on, they are not always like that. They can actually be quite complex to, to negotiate. So let's start by looking at uh, expectations and consent. Um, so the Belmont principles include respect for someone's autonomy. In other words, you respect the fact that someone can make a decision as to whether or not to participate in research, whether that's participation through a primary data capture, so you, you give them the questionnaire or an interview or something like that, or whether this is data that is available publicly or through a, a gatekeeper, you know, but existing captured secondary data. Um, they have a right to know whether that data is going to be used in research. And so this gets us to thinking about expectations, particularly in the online context, where we can't always ask people. Um, so just because they've made something visible in public doesn't necessarily mean they expect to be researched on the basis of it. So another analogy for this would be you might be do, I don't know, doing the ironing in your front room. And so you might reasonably expect that somebody walking past your house notices that you're doing the ironing, sees what you're doing. That doesn't necessarily mean you'd be happy for a researcher to park themselves outside your front window and study how you're doing the ironing. Um, these are these are different levels of, of interaction. So it's a private activity. It is on public display, but that's not the same thing as you expecting someone uh, to be uh, studying it as if it was being done in public. So public visibility is not a not necessarily a proxy for consent, uh, and nor necessarily a reliable proxy on its own, at least for expectation. Somebody leaving a review, for example, on a site like Amazon or Airbnb or the Apple App Store is doing that with the expectation that this will be used by others looking at the product to decide them, you know, to help them whether they want to buy it or not. That's not the same thing as expecting their data to be studied. Now, they may recognize that as a risk of leaving the review on the site, but it may well not occur to them because the context of those two activities is very different. Um, and so when we're looking at that from an ethics point of view as a researcher, um, it's not necessarily legitimate simply to say, well, it's public, so we can, we can do that. We have to think about the, uh, the expectation there. So in my view, there's a, a difference between what we might call a manifest act of publication. In other words, explicit steps taken to disseminate information explicitly for any purpose, so like publishing a book or an article by sending it to a publisher or in software, putting a license on it. And there's a difference between those things and simply having things visible in public. The former thing carries a, a clear understanding and intention for people to treat the work how they like, but in the latter case, we can't guarantee that. It doesn't mean it's not there, but we have to think perhaps a bit more carefully um, about uh, how we would defend our research in that situation. It's an ongoing debate, and there's, I've got some pointers to other, other sources here. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, I think the important thing is to recognise the question is there. And what this brings us to is the concept of ethical defensibility. So we're not here necessarily trying to aim at saying this piece of research is ethical or is not ethical. We're making a judgment about the defensibility of that research to the audiences who might wish to uh, engage with it. So it's a judgment considering motivation, consent, expectation, impact and so on. And it determines whether or not that activity could be considered ethically defensible in its temporal and, and social context. And this is why it's very hard to determine upfront whether available data is simply okay to use for any purpose because the, the complete set of factors have to include that purpose when you make the judgment. And that also includes conditions that gatekeepers to the information have and what they have said to the people providing the data. The people who surrender the data to them are given guarantees. And we'll see this in, for example, the context of Twitter. So, you know, the question we're asking is what do people expect to happen to that data and what evidence do we have of their understanding and their consent? And from that, we can start to build our ethical, our ethical case. So there's various ways we can we can find out about expectations. Uh, the simplest is if these are made explicit at the time of, of data surrender. So we have a consent form, we say, this is the data we want. And uh, if we're thinking we might release that data later, then we can say, we're gonna make your data available under these conditions. Um, and if someone signs the consent form, well then great, we've got, uh, we've got informed consent. It is terribly helpful actually though, if people say that in then subsequent publications, because one of the tricky things I find in review is that data exists and it's unclear then whether or not it was uh, obtained under that. And it makes the downstream work much easier for, for other people using the data. If there's an explicit um, statement somewhere in like, either with the data set or something that this was handled under a, uh, you know, an informed consent. 
consent thing. And sometimes there are access restrictions. So there are some medical data sets where uh, bona fide researchers have to prove their credentials to be granted access. Uh, anonymization is often used as a way to protect participants, and that's good, but alone it's not uh, necessarily sufficient to justify making the data available without consent because it doesn't respect the autonomy of the, the participant. So if you've got the data, but you didn't ask them uh, whether you could share it or not, there is an ethical question of whether if you just share it and say, well, it's okay, it's anonymous, um, whether you have respected the ethical principle. The harm perhaps is not vastly different, but, but from a principled position of ethics, one should, be, one should be asking. And so one way to do that is to go back and ask. Uh, so if you have, still have the ability to contact your participants and you decide later you want to share data, great go back and ask them uh, and reconsent for that for that aspect of course if you've anonymized your data internally that will be extremely tricky the area that we tend to deal with most i suppose with online existing data sets are things like terms and conditions so this is uh, they're not on their own a proxy for ethical consent but they can be a very helpful source of information and this is where we start to get into this interaction between some of the legal aspects and some of the ethical ones um, but it's not that some com compliance with terms and conditions necessarily means things are okay ethically or vice versa. So this is where you've got situations where the informed consent is difficult because of scale or difficulty or even the unacceptability of contacting potential participants. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So here we're using what I would call as implied consent. In other words, you're going to have to say, well, we think the consent is there because X, Y and Z things have taken place. So if you are studying data on something like Twitter, you can't realistically ex contact everybody whose tweets you might want to study. So in justifying the ethical nature of the research to an oversight body, you may need to argue for a waiver from finding normal informed consent and rely on argument. And in broad terms, I would say in that kind of situation, if you can show that the terms offered to people uh, who provide data to the site are very clear about its public visibility, and the site itself, which is a stakeholder in the research in this case, also gives permission for the use, you can reasonably argue that the expectations of participants are in line with your use, and consent can then be implied rather than explicit, but only while the data is available. And the consequence of that line of reasoning is that if the data ceases to be available, you can't assume the consent anymore, and particularly not where there's explicit control over this. So Twitter, for example, allows you to remove your data from public visibility and expect people who use that data to, to com comply and respect that decision. And so uh, it's not reasonable from an ethics point of view, as far as I see it, to say that data that was once visible um, is therefore effectively always available. It's, it's When it's visible, it's usable. When it's not, it's not. And this is where we get the blurred line between the primary and the secondary, because in actual fact, it's not really a secondary data source in the sense of being a fixed data set, it's a dynamic data set. Some websites explicitly tell users that their data may be used for others, by other people for research or other purposes and others don't. I've seen sites that give permission only for the use of the data for the purposes of the site. One particular case I recall was charity fundraising. So if you use the data for research, you'd be breaching both the terms of use and the reasonable expectations of people putting data on that site. There's nothing about the site that would suggest to a potential user that their uh, data would relate to anything other than other than fundraising. And this brings in the fact that sites themselves may have a consent requirement. They're a, they're a stakeholder uh, and as a gatekeeper to the, to the data. Uh, so the Menlo report that I mentioned there talks about doing stakeholder analysis as part of the ethical, um, the ethical assessment. And I think broadly that brings up a point about recognising the nature of the research one is doing and then consulting the appropriate ethics code. And this kind of comes back to Malcolm's work that I talked about earlier on. So just because you're doing computational research with online data doesn't necessarily make it computer science research. It might be social science, digital social science, and it may mean that multiple ethics codes are then in play. So it might be that you need a code for handling your general disciplinary norms, so consent matters and that kind of thing. Another one around technological factors and possibly even the third one for some of the consent methods. And then you can need to bring all those together to make an ethical defense. So. Uh, to my mind, one has to be quite pluralistic in how one looks at uh, these things and be aware that uh, one is perhaps stepping outside one's home discipline a little bit uh, and, and consult the relevant uh, areas. So this naturally brings us to contracts because we're talking about terms and, and conditions here. So contracts can constrain the data, what you can do with it, what you can, where you can store it and that sort of thing. 
they govern the way in which participants use a platform and how researchers get access to the data. And I've used the term participants here quite specifically because although we're talking about data, in my view, data is not divorced from a person. Data either, we, we tried to capture this when we wrote the nine uh, ethics conference code, which is quite a values oriented code. We stated the position as data about an individual is an expression of that individual and deserves the same protection, level of ethical protection as the individual themselves. Now, of course, you know, there may be plenty of people who disagree with me on that, but to my mind, if you think about data as an expression of a person, then you it helps to think about the ethics of dealing with it because it's like thinking about dealing uh, with the ethics of, of how you would treat someone uh, if they were actually there. And of course, how you do that and how you provide that protection is a, a case-specific decision. So contracts play a couple of roles. They govern the legal agreement between the two parties and, and there are certain contexts in which the parties would be the, the two organisations concerned. So it might be your university and the company, even if you're the one making the, the sign-up agreement. Um, the constraints therefore potentially place legal restrictions on what you can do. Uh, an organisation may choose via its ethics oversight and executive functions to take a legal risk to breach the contract if it thinks that the, ethical, the, the, the goals are ethically justifiable. It's a matter for each organisation individually. Um, and I'm noting, but not going to get into any depth here, that the GDPR applies to this data just because it's secondary data. If it's personally identifiable, GDPR or your relevant data protection. Uh, regime may well apply um, to that. So contracts don't exactly solve our problem and in fact they can create new problems and new risks. So uh, the other paper I've cited on that side, Schwa's paper, describes a very interesting experience of, of negotiating ethical tensions with terms and conditions. It highlights many of the, term, the issues we, we've identified here already, so differences in expectation, uh, evidence for manifest publication intention, and also matters uh, around the transformation perspective on data. So material might be covered by copyright in one uh, scenario of use, but just regarded as data in a different one. Um, and Shwai also noted the unwillingness of platforms to advise researchers specifically. Um, so I think perhaps the, the key point that came out of that paper is, is the, the fact that the ethical decision must be contextualised and consider the platform and the experiences of users and just and go beyond guidelines in terms of conditions. So, so all of this is, a, is an exercise in gathering information to then uh, look at the, the ethics. Uh, so we'll look at just a couple more areas before we briefly look at some of the examples. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about here really comes down to whether the access you have to the data is technical or legitimate. Uh, well, it'd be probably both or totally technical. Um, so, you know, you can get to data from other ways. You can read the website yourself. Uh, that's usually legitimate. It's not scalable to any kind of size of, of data, but you can usually do it without restriction. And it's typically within the purpose of having the website. That's what websites are for. Um, you can go through an API, an application programming interface. These tend to have contractual terms on access and use, uh, so rate limiting, controlled inference, and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's uh, it's usually an allowable thing. There's there's a contract between you and the site in doing so. Uh, scraping, on the other hand, uh, is typically disallowed. I've only come across one site that permits it, and even then, only for a very limited type of data. Uh, so sites will typically allow crawling for the site structure. Uh, but not scraping for the content. Uh, and there could be lots of reasons for that. It might be, you know, it gives them no control over the data access at scale. Uh, it may offer no control over data inference at scale. And all of those things may put them in breach of the agreements they've made with the people providing the data. Uh, you've also got problems that if lots of people are scraping, then you might end up with a denial of service on the site because it gets overloaded by the algorithms. And that could lead to tangible loss for the organization if they can't transact business. Um, and from a more ethical standpoint, it's contrary to the purpose of a website and providing information to humans. It's a kind of a misuse, if you like, the human interface for the purposes of data acquisition. So those are all reasonable things, but the question then is, how do we do research on perhaps sort of sensitive areas? And there have been quite significant concerns raised about this. So Bruins has an excellent paper um, that goes into this in quite some depth, um, particularly about the introduction of APIs and, and the impacts that's had on scholarly research. Uh, Bryn's identified four responses to this, the first being walking away, not researching the space, the second is lobbying for change, the third to accommodate and acquiesce, in other words limit the research one does to what is allowed by the API, and the fourth is to break the rules, in other words work against the terms and conditions and take the risks that come, come with that. Um, so that's if you like a researcher response to it, you know what the response of researchers to the, to the concerns about the controls this puts on it. Um, but as I've said, there are you know, genuine issues for companies in this where they're running platforms because they may have 
contracted themselves with the people who provide the data. And so a researcher researching against the terms may actually um, put the company in some kind of breach of, uh, breach of its own agreements. Um, on the other side of this, of course, there are platform responses too. Um, so one part of ethics assessment that's often neglected actually is the identification and management of risk to the research team and the research organization. Um, and because you've got this interaction between regulation and contract and copyright and the ethical case, you, you need that aspect of reflexivity. Um, in the same way you would if you were putting a researcher into a situation of personal danger, it, you can have sort of legal or other consequences in this space. So um, there have been some press reports recently about a dispute going on between Facebook and New York University. Um, and as I understand it, Facebook issued cease and desist letters to the team and in due course it actually suspended the individual accounts of the researchers on the grounds that they were violating the terms of service regarding scraping data. Now I'm, I'm not in a position to judge the veracity of claims on either side of that, but the point for the discussion we've got here is that the contractual framing uh, to the data access sets the context for the research and in this case that appears to have created risk to an institution and it's created risk to the researchers because they've lost access to their accounts um, and you know the, the effect of all of that is that other people have lost access to the data too so you've got this broad stakeholder perspective so there are responses happening on both sides let's just briefly have a couple of uh, i'm going to go through this quite fast because i suspect i'm well up on my time now um, so we'll start with twitter um, I'm sure everyone's very familiar with Twitter, microblogging site. I'm talking here about public data uh, on Twitter. There are some obvious stakeholders in this, people who uh, post tweets, uh, people who are posted about the subjects of those tweets, uh, people who consume that via the kind of app, website and apps, and people who harvest it. So it's typically more the researchers are falling into the harvester category. Uh, Twitter's a stakeholder, they might be your employer and, and other researchers and stuff. So lots of stakeholders. Uh, as I've alluded to already, I think this blurs the line between primary and secondary data because the data is only ever as it stands, because Twitter requires people who access its data through the API to respect the controls it offers. So it's private data on public display. The public never gets control uh, of the data. From a consent side of things, we have consent from Twitter itself, the organization for doing research. That's explicit, but it's conditional. So it's happy to make data available for research, but only via the API. You have to agree to certain conditions and that changes the kinds of things you can study uh, and you have to agree to respect what users decide to do with their tweets whether they delete them hide them and that kind of thing you have consent from tweeters for research that's implicit and temporary so this comes back to the argument i made earlier on you know you by agreeing to the sign up terms you could argue that tweeters have given consent to the use of their data under the terms offered um, but it's a dynamic and implicit consent. It only holds while the data is visible. I'm going to leave one thing as an open question here is, what about ethical consent from the people who are mentioned in tweets, but are not tweeting? So they've never signed up to Twitter. They have no knowledge of Twitter's terms and somebody mentions them in a tweet and you study some data about them. There is an open ethical question there because I don't know how you would justify that one way or the other. There are some restricted use cases on Twitter. So there are certain things you can't study about individuals, many of which interestingly enough align to the GDPR special categories. Um, I don't know if that's coincidence or intentional, uh, but you can't assess an individual's health status and things like that. You can do it on aggregate. You can't do it on in individuals. And just also to know that anonymizing Twitter data if you keep the content is almost impossible because you can always just use a search engine to go and look it up again. Uh, there are compliance matters with Twitter. So you have to synchronize it regularly uh, and Twitter provides APIs to allow you to do that. Uh, one point from a research point of view uh, is that if you want to quote a tweet, uh, there is suggestion here, and I think this is filtered through into UKRI guidance somewhere along the line. I couldn't find it when I was preparing this, but I'm sure I've seen it there, um, that you should go and get post hoc um, consent to quote the tweet, because otherwise if the tweet's deleted from Twitter and you don't have a consent agreement, to quote somebody's tweet, you run the risk of Twitter saying you should delete that. Of course, if you publish that in a paper, that could be uh, difficult at that point. So there's a good discussion of all of that in, in the paper on the slide there. So this is the picture people tend to have of Twitter. They think, OK, we've got people tweeting, there's Twitter there, and I'm a harvester so I can get stuff. But actually, taking account of all the things I've said here, the picture's a little bit more like this. So you've got Twitter, you've got people providing tweets, they've agreed a contract. Uh, harvesters have agreed a contract with Twitter. Those contracts provide information towards the ethical consent arguments uh, that we find here. So that's what I've got in this heavy dash here to the harvesters. Um, 
there's like a realm of control, um, sorry, a realm of control around uh, the Twitter. So this is all the data they give to Twitter. And then you've got the filtered visibility for what's available at a given time by the user's permission. Um, and then we have some of the other constraints here um, around uh, how you share things. So if you're in Twitter, if you're sharing data from Twitter, you can only share the IDs, you can't share the content except in very limited and specific circumstances. Um, and the idea is that a data user rehydrates the tweets from Twitter at that point, meaning that the visibility is respected because if you've got an ID that's then been deleted, it, can, it doesn't come back to you. Um, so I've tried in this picture to capture the complexity um, of what appears to be quite a straightforward access to data. Uh, last example is repository mining. Um, this is something that um, my colleague Jens and I looked at. Um, Software is fine from this perspective because it's usually licensed. I say it's fine, it's there, there are nuances, but essentially it's usually licensed and you can study it on that basis because it's been manifestly published. But software repositories tend to have a lot more of the software in them. They have all the developer commits, information about developers. Uh, so studying the software is usually not ethically difficult. Studying the non-software data, you have to start looking at where's it hosted, what does the license cover, how sensitive is the data. And if you want to study the developers, you might need their consent, but that can be problematic because as uh, Baltas and Yale found, uh, developers really don't like being asked to participate in this stuff because they get so many requests for it. And in fact, the Software Heritage Archive, which is a big internet repository of, of software for the purposes of study, uh, describes the use of personal contact information for this kind of recruitment mass mailing as data misuse. Um, so it is, a, uh, it is a concern. So uh, I've blown my time budget and then some for which apologies um, but basically there are two points to take away the ethics of studying online data is complex uh, and it needs quite an active engagement um, you can find support for ethical justifications in the information given to people in the information that comes from the platforms um, and then it's a case of weighing up all those factors of what is what is ethical research so uh, thank you very much for your attention um, and I look forward to questions comments and however that pans out Nicholas, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Can everybody here um, just put something in the chat just to say, uh, so that Nicholas knows you did a great job, but say how fascinating that was or something. In particular, what you could think about writing is, what was your biggest takeaway from the lecture that Nicholas just gave? Or, or what was it that you really needed to hear today that was super helpful, that you're going to go away and it's going to shape your research going for, forward? Because I, you know, Nicholas, I, you know, I, I thought when we chatted a few months ago, I thought I thought what you had to say was brilliant. And it's it's even better now having you go into it in more detail with the graphics. It's extremely helpful having somebody take you through each individual bit of thinking of how the ethics and the legal terms and the assumptions all fit together um, and, and how, and therefore quite how big the problem is of how we use this published, but not necessarily public. I think I've got that right. Data ethically and responsibly. Other way around, um, public, but not necessarily published. There you go. Public, but not necessarily published <laughs> data ethically. Um, I think we probably have time for one question and one person asked the question earlier. Um, I'm just going to see if I can bring it up. Yes. So the question was from Lauren, is there a threshold threshold to determine data scraping? So e.g. the difference between researchers using search terms to manually collect hundreds of tweets from Twitter, which I think you've said is OK, because that's a human reading it, versus using automated machine learning methods to data scrape hundreds of thousands of tweets, which if I've understood is not OK. Do you just need the API? Do you need both for the API or just for the second? So my, I'm going to caveat this by saying my understanding of the current terms and conditions that Twitter operates under is that scraping is not permitted at all, um, but you can access through the API uh, very large numbers uh, of tweets. Um, I think I'm going to stay away from saying whether or not uh, search terms and manually copying is ethical or otherwise, because uh, that's, a, that's a contextual decision, if you like, for uh, a particular institution and a particular study uh, but my understanding is that that would not be problematic uh, from a, a Twitter conditions standpoint um, you would still have the issue I think that if you quoted the tweet and you didn't have a consent for quoting it and the tweet disappeared from Twitter uh, that might be an issue you might need to go and actually ask for consent to, to quote it or at least that's the best practice the best practice guidance um, so 
I, I, as I say, from, from a Twitter perspective, as I understand their terms, uh, hundreds of thousands of tweets gathered by scraping would be problematic because that would be a breach of the, the terms of use of Twitter's site. But you could achieve the same thing through the API. Uh, and when you apply for an API, Twitter has to approve your project. I don't think it's a particularly high bar to clear, um, but it doesn't just allow you to register. You do have to say, this is what I want to do and, and that kind of thing. Um, and that allows them to then exercise a degree of control uh, over, over the numbers. But the numbers then are, are fine. I mean, that, that is sort of what it's for. And in fact, they, they actively encourage, they have, a, they have various levels of access to tweet streams right up to the fire hose, which is exorbitantly expensive as I understand it, from a, certainly from a research budget point of view. Um, but gives you, you know, vast amounts of data to, um, to have available to you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Nicholas. The other thing that you mentioned, which I thought was fascinating, and I hadn't, obviously I'd seen it in the news, but I hadn't actually appreciated it, is that social media platforms who own their content and who disallow research on their platform were functionally stopping researchers from investigating the spread of disinformation or how harm can come about on the social media platform. And so we then have to rely on the business policing themselves, which is, of course, problematic, possibly. Do you yeah. have anything more to add there? Well, I think I think what this comes down to uh, is, a, is the tension, actually, you and I discussed this a few months ago, uh, is the tension as to whether people are publishing things or not. Mm. And I don't, that's a completely unresolved tension, I think, of whether the platform and or the person is a publisher, because it affects um, what you are free to do with that data or not and I think it also it, it impacts on whether or not it can be legitimately seen as a public space or otherwise you know from, from a research point of view these are important social spaces where much social interaction happens and in that sense uh, there's a perfectly good argument that this is a legitimate research target mm -hmm. but they are of course a controlled public space or a controlled space where there is public visibility um, I, a while ago I developed a, an analogy which I may not be able to remember clearly enough now but but around the idea of, of doing research inside a company building and that you know if you wanted to go and look for information on the notice boards in a company you would need the company's permission to get into the building in the first place and that would not be considered unreasonable and so the same thing kind of applies here if you want to get into the building to have a look at what's there then then maybe that's not unreasonable but the flip side of that is that if you want to go and research what's going on in that company because you have genuine you know concerns for its social impact and things like that then you know how do you do that and I, I, uh, uh, Axel Brun's paper is is very very good on this that's it's an excellent source on on the issues and the impact of um, the kind of semi-closed uh, ecosystems and how that can affect critical scholarly research you know, yeah, I'm that's very really, carefully really... not coming down on one side or the other. Yeah, yeah. I know, and I think it's important because these are such nuanced questions. I think we don't yet know the answer, and I think it's always great when I, when when we can speak without having to be categorical. We can just say mm. th this is nuanced. We're each going to have to make our own very carefully considered decisions with advice from experts. And this, um, I think, is where ethical defensibility comes in. It comes down to can you defend what you're doing from an ethical standpoint rather than aiming at it's ethical or it's not ethical. Um, yeah, and I think this is also often the case, and I'll come to this in my talk about information security and accessibility, there isn't, there isn't a point at which you're done and it's okay and you've got a tick box, this yeah. is a journey, it's perpetually a journey, you can always do better, and you could always do worse, you have to work out what is appropriate, given, given the situation. And you have to keep doing it while you're doing the research, I think that's the other yeah. thing, you know, there's a tendency, because organisations tend to work with procedural ethics, and it's sort of like, this is what I want to do, good, it's gone through the committee, we've got our approval letter, and that's great. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable way of doing it, but there are some kinds of research, and particularly, I think, in the data space, where you think, oh, well, I'll add another data source in. You know, there needs to be an ongoing ethical uh, consideration happening there. It needs to be, it's very much, um, as I said at the beginning, you know, Annette Markham's thing of ethicus method and method is ethics. As soon as you add a data source, you've changed your method yeah. a little bit. And so now you have to say, did that change our ethical position? And does that change how we, how we engage with that? This is brilliant. We're now going to have to go on to Justin, who no doubt is going to be equally fascinating. I've linked up the um, the Brune uh, paper in the chat. So if you guys want to scroll up, you can find us again. If not, Nicholas, maybe you can post it into the chat as well, because yep. I think everybody will want to take that one away. Um, Justin, come on. All right. Uh, good right. morning from Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon to everyone who is not here, which is everyone else. Um, 
we have, you probably know the company because uh, I read the introductions that everyone's uh, been putting in the chat room. And uh, I think um, just about all of you are using our software to manage your participant pool and recruit participants. So no need to explain about that. What I will mention is that we're in our uh, now 20th year of business. So we've really watched how things have evolved from 20 years ago when you're convincing people that we'll do things online. And that was sort of a, a a very novel concept back then to getting into nowadays that's accepted and there's just a lot more technical details and and a lot of questions which is what we'll get into which can come up with this type of thing there's uh make sure this goes there we go um oop, all right yeah so there's uh three areas uh, i thought i'd cover and i'm gonna try to cover each of them briefly uh just like uh nicholas said i am not a lawyer so uh, always consult with your local council as well as your ethics board, but we're just kind of reflecting on what we've seen and things to consider. So essentially, uh, my job today is to scare you and uh, to make you sort of consider all the possibilities and then decide how scared you want to be or also how scared your university uh, administrators might be. So, so that's what we'll be looking at. And uh, not everything is scary, but let's just consider the possibilities and then we can figure out how to deal with them. Uh, accessibility, and this definition comes from uh, Mozilla's developer site. Uh, the practice of making your websites usable by as many people as possible. Uh, in previous talks I've given, uh, there's been pushback on this. And uh, some people say, but I only want my study. I don't care about accessibility because it doesn't matter if uh, I'll, I'd rather exclude people who um, are colorblind or people who um, navigate uh, not using a mouse, but using the keyboard, things like that, I'll just exclude them. But the question you need to think of, even ethically, is, is why. All these people are members of society, and assuming that your research is not, why should you be excluding them? Occasionally, there are cases, for example, um, you're, you're testing visual stimuli, you might need to exclude people who are visually impaired. That makes sense. But um, where I think it where I think the argument is not as strong is where you're saying, I will exclude this group solely because the tool I'm using doesn't make this possible. Uh, and a perfect example right now is we're on Zoom and this is being recorded and um, the option has been turned on where it's also transcribing or captioning uh, this meeting. So why not? The tool has the option. Now we can make it available to people who have hearing impairments. Why not? There's no reason to exclude them, for example, in this type of presentation. So, um, so I, I take the, um, I think that really you should look at, do I have a good reason to exclude a, a certain group? It could be experimental design, that's fine. But if you don't, you should do everything you can not to exclude them. And then let's look, look at why. So we have uh, in the UK, there's the Equality Act. In the US, there's Section 508. And then Europe has a standard uh, with lots of numbers and things like that. Uh, now, the other thing which will come up, and we'll see this later as well, is, well, maybe what do I care about Section 508? I'm in the UK. However, what you need to look at is things like if you're collaborating with people or your funding sources. So sometimes with a funding source, that will be a stipulation. So maybe the, some of the funding is coming from an agency or a group that's in a country different from where you're located, and they have stipulated that you need to comply. Um, or maybe one of your collaborators is in one of those countries and therefore they need to comply. Uh, and you'll notice that most on top of that, let's forget the laws on there. Most universities have made a commitment to accessibility. In fact, if you go to a lot of university websites, you go to the bottom of their page, you'll often see a link that says accessibility statement. So even leaving the law aside, the university policy may be to comply, and that's probably a good one. So you should absolutely think about that. Now, what types of considerations do we need to make? Um, on the visual side, um, we can imagine some of the, the typical ones you think about are descriptive text. So you have an image, let's let's have descriptive text for it. Um, but the other things to look at are uh, font size and color contrast. And there are actually tools which let you measure that. And it will say that once the font is larger than this size, then your color contrast needs to be 3.5 to one. And if it's lower, it needs to be 4.5 to one or, or something like that. But these are defined 
in the standards. And then there's tools to check for this. And uh, let me tell you from experience that university accessibility experts do actually check this and they will come after you if you're off by this. And we've had many debates with universities sometimes and, and there, there's sometimes a gray area, but definitely consider things like this. Why are we using a small font when is, is why are we making it difficult for people with visual impairments or, or even just um, older users, older participants uh, who may have difficulty with smaller text. Uh, and then realize that people with visual impairments uh, are often using screen readers. So you want to consider the navigation. And there are a lot of tools have this kind of stuff built in. Uh, so consider that when you're evaluating the tools you use. Um, but think about navigation as well. Um, hearing impairments, are the obvious case is to provide captioning. Um, so another example there is maybe your study is conducted over Zoom. Well, you could turn on the captioning there, or you could type the instructions in the chat window if you're working with a participant who has a hearing impairment. Uh, mobility impairments are interesting. Um, a lot of people think, well, why do we, who's mobility impaired? What, what does this matter? Uh, so what we've seen in the last uh, last few years is that a lot of people who served in the military are now going back to university. And unfortunately, a number of those people have lost use of their uh, their hands uh, because of explosions and things and, and all that type of stuff. So they often cannot uh, grasp a mouse, uh, but they can navigate using the keyboard or some people are even navigating using their eyes. But the, the point is they cannot use a mouse. So uh, why not make your online tool accessible, navigable with the keyboard. Uh, normally it's using the, the tab button and things like that. There are there are tools to check for this, but you can actually just sort of check on your own and tab through and things like that. But um, why not make it so that they can, let's say you have a, a Likert scale and a couple of choices, let them be able to tab through that and select those choices because they may not have be able to use a mouse. Uh, and then another one we're seeing lately is uh, cognitive impairments. Uh, a big push here, and this is this is particularly strong in uh, ethics when you're looking at informed consent. A lot of informed consent is written by uh, lawyers or, or similar, and it is not in plain language that a person who is not as well educated as a lawyer can understand. So there's no harm in plain language, even if you're dealing with an educated set of participants, why not be clearer? And uh, so, so that's one thing we see. And another is uh, to be consistent in the layout, avoiding unnecessary content. We've actually, in our system, we changed something uh, a few months ago where we received feedback from uh, some people with cognitive impairments who were saying that they were having difficulty navigating a certain part of the calendar because it was, it was presenting data, um, information about the days of the week um, repetitively. And so we looked at that and decided how to recategorize that to deal with that. So it's something to think about. Now, when you're looking at products to say, OK, well, will they meet these guidelines? Because you're probably not not everyone. Most people are not writing their own, let's say, online survey or something like that. There is a way to check for this compliance. So there is a standard out there called the VPAT. Um, it's produced by an uh, organization in the IT industry called uh, ITIL. You can just Google VPAT. That's really, that's such a unique uh, acronym. Uh, but basically what it does, it, it's a long, it's a 50-page uh, long document, but it, it it's where the vendor explains how their product complies with all the various areas. And then there's a score. It's like a, a letter score. You can have like A, AA, or AAA a level of compliance. And note here too that this is an example page from it. We're also seeing how it goes down to detail, like not only just your product, but what about the documentation or any other tools that are related to around it? Like it mentioned authoring tools. So maybe it's an online survey has an authoring tool and then it has what you present to participants. So the, ev the evaluation is asking about all those. Not, not all of these always apply, but, uh, but they are there. So, so that's a good way uh, to when you have a product, just ask in any vendor should be able to easily provide that. Can I have a copy of your VPAT? This is a common, uh, it's used industry-wide and that's something they should be able to provide. And then something you can provide if your accessibility team needs to review the product or review the situation. And it's also good as part of your ethics approval. Say, well, 
I've uh, obtained the VPAT, I have it available uh, to ensure that they uh, are following the accessibility guidelines. What happens if you don't? Well, here's an example just from, uh, I guess, about a year and a half ago um, when uh, COVID sort of started and a lot of universities moved online. There was a uh, 17 times increase in lawsuits uh, because the universities were using products which were not accessible. This is the scary part. So you really don't want, you don't want to be the one that's the cause of the lawsuits. And what we're actually seeing in the US is, uh, especially uh, with smaller companies, is there's people out there who will specifically, um, I guess you kind of call them lawsuit trolls or something. They will actually target uh, companies whose websites are not accessible and say, your, your stuff is not accessible. I'm going to sue you. And then the companies are say, all right, let's just settle you know, here's $10,000, make it go away. And that kind of thing, they're, they're essentially trolling, but you really don't want to be the one that that is the uh, result of uh, somebody filing a major lawsuit against your university uh, for it not being accessible. Next topic is security. And uh, I, I noticed there were already some questions in the chat window about this. Uh, we'll give sort of an overview here. Uh, but there's different parts of security. One is safeguarding your data. And there's both the physical and the sort of the logical virtual side of it. Uh, and then reliability and then uh, how to handle data breaches. Uh, with the physical, basically, most uh, well, cloud services sit in data centers. They're all over the place. Um, for a little bit of trivia, the largest um, sort of data center capital of the world is in a place called Ashburn, Virginia. If you ever fly into Washington Dulles Airport, as you're coming in, look to your left, look to your right, you're going to see data centers everywhere. They basically look like warehouses, but there's not a lot of cars there and there's, there's very few loading docks. Normal warehouses have a whole bunch of loading docks, they'll have like one or two. Uh, there's over 140 data centers there, and these things are the size of football fields. They're massive. Uh, it just so happens that's the largest area for this because of uh, the internet was originally started because of US Department of Defense and DARPA and things like that. Anyway, data centers, you want to make sure that your data is physically secure. Can someone just walk right in there. There was actually a case years and years ago in Chicago where uh, a bunch of, and I'm not making this up, a bunch of armed gunmen walked into a data center, held up the guards, and stole the equipment. Now, they weren't actually after the data. What they were after is at the time, uh, Cisco routers were very expensive. These things can run over $100,000. And so they actually carted out this very expensive computer equipment. Um, I don't know if there's been something like that since, but anyway, the point is you want to make sure that um, you're, wherever this is hosted, the facilities are secure. Now, if you're using a major provider like Amazon, um, Microsoft Azure, one of these, that, that's typically covered. And what they will do is they'll be able to provide you with a report. Uh, one of them is known as an SOC2, and there's also an ISO 27001. These are very common reports. So they can typically provide these, and it basically is uh, an audit report where a third party has gone in and audited the controls of the data center. And often it's about access control. So it's things like, all right, when an employee leaves, uh, has their... Um, their access badge been revoked and have their keys been taken and things like that. It's just ensuring that they're following general physical uh, security standards. Uh, normally, that's not your not your problem. Uh, no, that's not going to be the issue. Much more likely when uh, there are data breaches or, or this kind of thing, it comes actually what I call on the virtual side. So people accessing the computers through uh, or finding security vulnerabilities. Uh, and there's different things you can ask for. So, so one thing is there are coding standards uh, to ensure that in the case of web applications, there are um, certain steps have been followed. And, and one of those, which is commonly referred to as called OWASP, and that just covers, and it's updated every year or two, and it just covers some different types of uh, scenarios and says, okay, are you following these guidelines for how we protect against them? Uh, another is third-party testing. So, uh, for example, in, in our case, we, we hire a company that tries to break into our software, and then they produce a report which then you can make available to say, okay, we've had a third party. They've, they've done their best to try to break in, and, and here's the results of that. Uh, and then there's also things like vulnerability scans. So uh, there are just automated tools that will go out there and it will check that uh, 
your there's various vulnerabilities that come out that software has bugs in it. Uh, normally, it's not in uh, the tool you're using, but the underlying, like if it's running on Windows or, or Linux or something like that, there might be vulnerabilities there. And so that kind of scans for that because this this is basically how hackers get into servers. It's, it's these types of things. Uh, so um, when you're looking at tools, uh, make sure that they've kind of covered those things because a university IT department who's doing an evaluation, they most certainly will ask for information like that. What's an example? Well, uh, there was an issue that came out last month called Log4j, and it's a uh, library, so basically a set of computer code uh, component that's used by a huge number of software products out there. And there was a vulnerability which would, was a sort of a major security hole. And I mean, here's Google's identified 35,000 software products out there are, are using this. And what was difficult to track it down is that uh, a lot of products use this log4j deep down inside the product. So you don't actually know when you license a product if they're using it or not. And so uh, a lot of, uh, this is a big problem. So a lot of, in fact, university IT departments were contacting us saying, are you using log4j? Have you applied the fixes? Because this, this was a big vulnerability. In our case, we weren't even using it, but we did have to check. And we also had to check some vendor products we use and say, okay, are, are we using it there? So these are the kinds of things where um, these come out all the time. And you just want to make sure that whatever product you're using, that they're uh, being sure to handle whatever vulnerabilities come out and uh, patch those quickly. Uh, a lot of the cases of um, break-ins are because just people weren't patching. Now, another thing is then how do we evaluate? And I've raised up a, a, a many different issues here, coding standards, physical data center security, patch process. There's all these different things. And so how do we, well, I can't go asking each question and I'm not gonna keep track of what it is to ask of a, a vendor I'm looking at, of the product I'm looking at. So there's actually a standardized template for this as well. So the, the previous one we had was called VPAT. That's for accessibility. But we have another nice acronym, HECVAT. It's made just by the higher education community and it's a toolkit. So it's basically a standardized form that the vendor can provide, which explains in uh, very great detail, all these types of processes, like what certifications does your data center have? What coding standards do you follow? And as you can see, well, this is probably hard to read, but this is uh, very detailed. So, uh, you know, are your access controls, are you using RBAC, ABAC or PBAC? Um, is your mobile application available from a trusted source and app store? So it goes into a lot of detail, uh, but that's important. So the idea here is if you're looking at something, you can just get an, a heck vat and then provide that to your IT department or whoever's doing the review. So this makes it a lot easier. And also vendors like this too, because otherwise universities have their own custom forms each time. And that's a big mess and takes so much time. So just here's a standard form to show that we're compatible and that we, we meet various security uh, guidelines. Um, the next one is reliability. Now, what's reliability? Reliability is your ability to for the service you're using to stay up and operational. Um, all kinds of things can happen like this. So in Strasbourg, uh, and it was, uh, I think about a year ago, uh, a little bit more than a year ago, that's a data center that caught on fire. Uh, that's the actual data center. Uh, and well, that's a fire. So um, this this occurred uh, and there were a number of websites that went offline because the data center caught on fire. Now, this to be fair is an edge case. This doesn't happen very often. First data centers actually have fire suppression systems and they're, they're very good, but it can still take things down. Uh, we actually had an issue ourselves. It was uh, many, many years ago when our company had, was, was just in the early stages. And we had, this is before cloud computing, so, but we had servers sitting in a data center and the, uh, the power went off. Now, this is not a problem at a data center. They have uh, backup batteries and they have backup generators that generate power. So that's no problem. You can be offline for hours and hours or your power could be off and you're up and running. Uh, however, the generator kicks on and then the generator catches on fire. So now the generator's on fire and the fire department comes in and the fire marshal says, well, look, I'm not having my fire uh, fire." Uh, people go try to put out this fire while this thing is generating power or I'm not having anything to do with power. I don't want anyone to get electrocuted. So by order of the fire marshal, we're cutting off all power to the entire building while we fight this fire. Very understandable. Don't want anyone to get hurt. So 
we went offline while they're fighting the fire of the generator. And then about two hours later, it came back up again. But you never know what can happen. Uh, this, um, this scenario actually affected uh, one of the popular survey tools, not anyone in this chat right now. Uh, and I, I, there's no need to mention names because to be honest, this really can happen to anyone. But it did affect one of the survey tools uh, that is commonly used. Uh, they were hosted in one of these data centers. Uh, there are, people can recover, there are backups. It's just something you look at. And in that form I mentioned before, the, the HECFAT would actually ask questions like this. Are your backups stored offsite? What is something called your recovery time objective and your recovery point objective? So for example, for our company, we actually say, well, well this, this scenario is highly unlikely, but still possible. So if this were to happen, we would actually take a risk of losing up to 24 hours of data, not more than 24 hours, but once a day, all the data we back up is sent to a location that's hundreds of miles away, therefore would not be affected by this kind of environmental situation. It's actually thousands of miles away. So, um, so these are the kind of things, and these are judgment calls you make, but um, that's the kind of thing that's important to look at. So the, the last, uh, well, the last area in security is uh, data breaches. So what's a data breach? It's when, well, hackers get in and they get the data. And this happens a lot. Uh, and this is what I think makes university IT staff particularly worried because you never know what can get out. You never know what's being stored. Uh, this, this case affected uh, University of California and it got their full names, address, telephone numbers, social security numbers, driver's license information, passport information, bank details. That's pretty bad. And uh, now, uh, so think about that one. Now there's really, you can only do so much. We've talked about these different ways to protect yourself, but there can always be some way, it's always possible that something can happen. It could be that there's a vulnerability that's discovered and, the, um, and then the patch takes a few days to be released and it gets exploited during that time. You never know. Even, so in other words, even the people who, who do as much as they can, there's still always this small chance. Uh, so one thing to look at there is, does your vendor have insurance against this? So do they have what's called cyber liability or data breach insurance? Normally that will cover the cost of restoring the data. It'll cover the cost of uh, mitigating this, of uh, providing people with uh, identity um, theft protection, different things like that. But um, that's just something to look at. And it's something that we get asked about, okay, where's your cyber liability insurance? And well, we have it and we provide that, but these are the kinds of things. Um, you also have ransomware. So here's one. And how did this happen? Well, at Michigan State University, the physics and astronomy department decided to go out on their own and develop something instead of using what the central IT department provided. And well, I guess the physics and astronomy department wasn't as uh, quick to keep things updated as the main IT department. So they got subjected to a ransomware attack that cost the university over a million dollars to recover from. So this is something to think about when it's, well, we can just write this on our own, we can do this. Well, consider all of that. Uh, there are risks to that. Um, a lot of people are great at producing software to accomplish their task, but then the security around it, the reliability around it, those are a lot of sometimes best left to the experts. It, it can be pretty tough to, it's a, it's a constant uh, effort to handle that. So lastly, we'll look at the uh, regulatory side of that. We reference GDPR. Uh, there, are, there are similar things in California, CCPA. Uh, and then from the ethics side, um, in the US, it's called common rule. Um, and so um, we have th these types of um, regulations that, that should be considered. Uh, what happens if you don't? Well, here's a university in Italy that got fined 200,000 euros for, um, for not following uh, GDPR. Uh, in this case, they were using a uh, software that was based in the US, which is actually okay, but you need a uh, you need to cover yourself properly. So here's here's one thing that people don't always understand about GDPR. So I'll mention it. It is okay to, for example, have your data stored outside Europe, but you need to tell people and you need to follow certain procedures. So there's a, GDPR doesn't lock you down to certain things. You just need to make sure that everyone's aware of it and that a contract has been entered and that certain procedures are followed. For example, you can certainly use a US vendor for, 
for things. And uh, even you can even have your data stored outside Europe. However, you would need to have something called standard contractual causes in, clauses in place. And then that would be covered under what's called um, DPA, a data processing addendum. Any vendors who deal with this all the time, they have these available. They're long, they're, I think ours is 35 pages long, but they cover exactly in detail how they protect data, the procedures they follow. And then as long as you alert the users to this scenario, that's totally fine. Um, a common case, if you uh, check in for an airline, it might be you're checking in to fly somewhere and you're maybe flying with a, a US-based airline, they will mention there, your data is going to the US. They've mentioned it, they're making you aware of that. And so they're allowed to do that. They just need to make you aware of it. And we see another case. So, so in this case, let me go back here real quick. So this university got fined 200,000 euros. A GDPR fine scale, uh, one based on the severity of the infraction and also based on the size of the uh, infringing company. So when you are Google or Facebook, you get much bigger fines, like 150 million or 60 million euros. So uh, yeah, universities probably aren't gonna get that, but either way, you don't even want the 200,000 fine. It's just, nobody wants this. So, so that's something to consider with the GDPR side. Uh, the other side then is the ethics side. So in the US it's common rule. Uh, and again, something which I mentioned at the beginning is that always consider, even if you're saying, well, I'm not in this jurisdiction, maybe my research is being, some of the funds are coming from there or one of my collaborators is. One example that came up, uh, now this one, if you can read it, this is the letter from the regulator in the US, the Office of Human Research Protections. And oh, this written to me. So um, I don't know whether this is a badge of honor or something to be afraid of when the regulator writes a letter to you uh, specifically. Uh, but what this was about, and this is from many years ago from 2010, is about um, the ability to uh, assessing a penalty for people who no show for a study. And it was found to be not in compliance with the regulations in the US. So they said, if somebody doesn't show up for a study, that could be their way of withdrawing is just by not showing up. So therefore you're not allowed, we believe it's against the regulations to assess a penalty. This is different in the UK. Don't, this is, I'm just talking about the US here. I'm just giving an, an example of a case where you do need to consider various regulations and the regulators are following this kind of stuff. So I think uh, that's about my time. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about our company because you know all about that. And you probably don't need to try a demo because everyone's using this. Uh, I'm happy to entertain any uh, questions right now. And then we'll go on to Joe from there. Uh, Justin, that was brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much. Everybody, you know the deal now, don't you? Could you please put into the chat, what was it that you needed to hear today? What was it that you have taken away and that's going to inform your research practice going forward? It's really useful for the speakers to know um, which messages are, are the most useful so that we get better and better at educating um, our users. Justin, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Obviously, this is this is territory we're very familiar with with Gorilla as well. But I think oftentimes we're just we see researchers trying to save hundreds of pounds and putting their university at risk of hundreds of thousands of pounds in data costs. Like we, it doesn't happen often, but how does how does that situation not like make you feel? What and what should a researcher do? Should they should they be filling out all these forms themselves? If you're building something in house, do you need to fill out the DPIA and the HECBAT and the the VPAT in order to make sure that you can't get sued? Right. So something developed in house. So so normally these forms are used to communicate between a vendor and the university to say we're meeting these requirements and, and things like that. So if you're developing something in house. You may or may not need to do that because, for example, let's say you're hosting out of the university servers. You already know some of those answers are already known because we, we're assuming the university maintains things. But where, where the question would come up is the security of what your, your own application, what, you, what you've written. Um, and, and there's a lot to follow up. So we saw a case, there's a open source tool uh, and the, it was somebody wrote it when they were a grad student and then they really just didn't update it for 10 years. And I guarantee you that when it was using a lot of libraries, uh, third party libraries, which have had security issues and that project just had not been updated. So maybe free may seem like a great price, but the price ultimately can be a lot higher when if you, you have that kind of, of risk. Um, there was, uh, and I'll just take the one or two questions. One question was yeah. about 
um, <clears throat> looking to um, uh, that just changed the chat. Uh, oh, sorry. Back. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, uh, looking to test, uh, looking to run participants who've been diagnosed with a particular condition and those without and collected the sample with the condition. So why can't I advertise it to those without the condition? Um, uh, seems to me, well, if the, I don't know if this is a question of how to use our software or the ethical side of it. <clears throat> the ethical side is a question for your, <clears throat> for the research side of it. Um, the easy way, if you want to set this in our system, is since you've already run a study for those who have the condition, then set up a second study and make the previous study a disqualifier, and that'll effectively uh, prevent them. Uh, the social model of disability disables people feeling their comfortable. Uh, okay, well, I, I think that's all the, uh, oh, uh, quick explanation of the software, you're only getting a sentence. So we manage the participant pool side. So it basically uh, manages the participants and gets them to sign up for studies uh, or, or enables them to sign up for studies that they qualify for. And I'll leave it at that because uh, I'm mindful. Of the well, you can always continue in the chat if you, if you want to. Yeah, you, sure. If you want to do that. Hi. So now I switch from my role as facilitator to a speaker, and then I'll jump back again at the end. Um, so to introduce you, you, I'm I'm Joe Evershed. I'm the founder CEO of Gorilla Experiment Builder, and I'm going to talk today about the practical steps you can take to keep you and your participants safe with online research. Over the last six years at Gorilla, we've helped thousands of researchers take psychology studies online. And we've helped them navigate hundreds of ethics committees and university, university procurement processes. We've seen a lot. So I'm going to share with you the information that you need in order to understand what's needed and stay in control, minimize your workload while keeping you, your university and your participants safe. I appreciate that you are all very busy people and, and your focus is research, but you do need to keep you, your university and your participants safe. Delegate the detailed due diligence work so that you can focus on the science, not university policies in the same way that I am not a lawyer and Nick is, Nicholas is not a lawyer and Justin is not a lawyer, you are not a lawyer either and it is not your job to work out whether everything is compliant and know how to use your university bureaucracy to your advantage and get a good return on those grant overhead fees that we know you will have to pay. So I know you want to get this stuff right, nobody likes the idea that they're doing something dangerous or illegal but it shouldn't be stressful or overly time consuming. So today I'm going to cover how to tell if a third party service provider is safe, how to ensure the tool you've chosen meets precision and accuracy required if you're collecting behavioral experiment data, sorry about the doorbell, um, how to protect your ethics committee from unnecessary anxiety and how to use your university bureaucracy staff to your advantage. So firstly, here's the scenario. You're a researcher looking to use a third party experiment building, hosting or recruitment service, and you'll need your procurement team to approve the purchase and release your grant funds. To do that, they'll need to run their due diligence checks for the reasons that Justin mentioned before. You're assessing a few different uh, providers, some cheaper, some more expensive, and but you only want to ask your university to review the ones that will pass the test. So how can you tell if a service provider is safe, or at least safe enough? Or at least um, in other words, the professional ones from the amateur ones or the ones that your university will be happy with versus the ones that might land you in hot water. It's, it's fairly easy. There's a short list of legal documents that you should that they should be able to provide you with. And it's not your job to read all of the details. Your university procurement team can do this. But knowing what each one does and why it's important will allow you to make an excellent initial assessment. So here they are. This is the checklist of what they should have and what they each mean. There should be some terms and conditions of use. Nicholas uh, mentioned those a lot in terms of understanding what the tool is for and what uh, and the limits of the data. The most important clauses here tend to be around intellectual property uh, and user content. User content is the content you add into that site and then also the governing law. Essentially, you want to understand who owns what. In the case of Gorilla, we own Gorilla, but you own all of your research protocol and the participant data data. A service provider that might be unsuitable for use and which I have seen in this space is one that retains ownership of all the data that's collected using their site, presumably for resale. The privacy policy governs how they handle the data for which they are the data controller. In our case, this is pretty, uh, this would be the researcher logs, um, login information and the subscription information. The data processing in co agreement in contrast governs how they handle data for which they are the data processor. In this case, this would be the experiment settings and the participant data. We process this on behalf of researchers in university who have signed up to our service. So obvious red flags here, 
what if there's no data processing agreement or a privacy policy trying to do the job of both being a privacy policy and a data processing agreement? So that's an easy thing to look out for. Another thing you want to look out for is a comprehensive list of suppliers. Justin mentioned how um, software is often built using subservices, and that's the point of the list of suppliers. Suppliers are the services that subprocess any of this data. For instance, our help desk software will also receive a researcher's name and email address. Similarly, similarly the emailing service we use for account setup and, and resetting passwords receives email addresses. Microsoft Azure will handle both research and participant information. Universities typically require that DPAs are signed with all of these suppliers. That way, if there is ever a problem, then the participant sues the uni, the uni sues us, we sue the supplier, and so on and so forth, all the way down. And in that example that Justin gave, that's what was missing. One of those steps was missing, so they couldn't go back to the, to, to the person at the end of the chain. Or if they could, that, um, if there was a reason that they couldn't, it wasn't in the DPIA, the, the risk assessment document. But of course, of course, uh, buying in a service usually allows you to comply to use usually use a company with better security credentials and they'll sign the DPA with you. But of course, that costs more. As you can imagine, all of these lawyers and information security professionals cost a lot of money. Free services typically have weaker security provisions or none whatsoever. A long list of suppliers is not a, a long list of suppliers is not an issue so long as DPOs, DPAs are signed with all of the suppliers. No suppliers might be worrying. It either means they aren't publishing their list of suppliers or they're building these services in-house, which comes with quality and security risks. Another thing to look out for is EU or UK representation. Under GDPR, consumers must be able to contact a legal representative of your company in their legal jurisdiction. So since our customers, researchers, uh, might use EU citizens as participants, regardless of where they live, we have an EU representative. If a service provider is outside of the UK, they should have a UK representative that you can contact. So here's the red flag. If someone says they're GDPR compliant, but doesn't have an EU or a UK rep when they should, then they're not com fully complying with GDPR. And then there's technical due diligence information usually needs to be reviewed by the university security team. In a nutshell, has the system been built professionally and securing, securely following the best practice security principles? And Justin mentioned some of the standards earlier. The, they'll be looking for things like geo redundancy of backups. That's a really important one for your data, data encryption, password strength, and a whole host of more things. If you can find this information somewhere, that's a good sign that the service provider is on top of it all. For those wishing to keep the cost, cost down, we have a short list of 21 technical safeguards on our due diligence pages, which is usually enough. And if you want to do a full information security procurement process where we answer the, that massive spreadsheet that Justin showed, the heck that, uh, the 5,500-ish 5, questions, then we'll charge you additional fees. And this is only, usually only necessary for, for enterprise contracts. So there are ways of, of um, Picking a service that is appropriate for your use case. Finally, on to accessibility. Um, even if you don't have an accessibility need yourself, your university policies may require that any tools that they procure meet accessibility standards. If over the last course of the last two years you had to caption videos for your online teaching, then that's a hint that your university takes accessibility seriously. A formal accessibility statement declares the level of accessibility for a service and will be required for any formal approval process. So the red flag here is, are any of these missing? And again, you don't need to read any of the details for these. Your university procurement team will do that for you. One word of advice, if you're using a software as a service product, uh, like Sona, like Gorilla, like Prolific, um, these documents cannot usually be varied without engaging into an enterprise contract. So be clear what you're asking your legal team to do. Something like, could you please review and approve the use of this supplier? The terms and conditions available are as presented. They can't usually be varied. Let me know if there are any risks that we should mitigate internally. The contract value is XXX because university policy will vary exactly what they require depending on the value of the contract because that changes the level of exposure. Okay, so next scenario, you found a service that meets all the legal and information security requirements, but there's no, sorry, have I skipped one? No, that's fine. Did I, oh, I might've done, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I'm looking at the wrong screen is why. Um, okay, so you found a service that meets the legal and information security requirements, 
but there's no point taking your research online if the data quality is going to be compromised. How can you tell that the tool you've chosen meets the precision and accuracy required? Here, we're particularly concerned with the precision and accuracy of stimulus to play and response capture. Thankfully, you also probably don't have to get massively into the detail here as other research teams have done the work for you. In 2020, two large scale timing papers were published, one by my team in collaboration with the Cambridge CBU and the other by the Psychopy team. The Psychopy team compared lab software to uh, lab software to online software using a butter box, which is a specialist input device to the computer, because this is how lab software has been evaluated in the past. And our test study tested online software in a more realistic setting. So using a keyboard, as this is what participants will use when taking part in the in a study from home. Together, these two papers paint a comprehensive picture. So the good news is the major finding was that for most, most users, the timing accuracy is pretty good across all of the tested tools definitely good enough for the vast majority of studies, especially if using within subject designs. And for those requiring higher levels of timing accuracy, limiting participants to one browser can improve data quality. If those papers are a bit intimidating, then Alex Irvin, my co-author, co has written a highly accessible blog, um, and the link to that is there. And I think Will's going to give you a copy of that and put it into the chat in case you want to read it. And from that, that paper, you can link to both of these other paper uh, the Psychopy one and the Gorilla one. Be cautious about using any software that hasn't been adequately tested. There are two broad worries here, wasting participant time, and secondly, wasting precious grant resources. It's eminently sensible to use reliable and validated equipment. That's just good science. What's the worst that could happen? If you're lucky, you just get unusable data, or your data will be so noisy that you can't pick up the behavioral signal. If you're unlucky, there'll be systematic errors in the timing calculations and you'll publish erroneous results that don't replicate. Here's the scenario. You've submitted your application and this is the first time you've done an online study. What's the best approach? Your ethics committee might be nervous about taking research online. Their job is to keep participants, researchers and the university safe from harm. And they have a duty to ensure that researchers are deploying grant funding sensibly. They've heard about GDPR and data breaches and scary fines, all those things that Justin was mentioning. They worry about new stuff, software and data loss. These were from manageable when you were only collecting data from 50 participants in a study. But now you're going to collect data from 1000 participants in an afternoon. The potential for loss is much greater. How can you get them comfortable? Tip number one, for your first study, if you can, consider replicating one that you've done in the lab. This is then just one change to a previous, previous application, so it's much easier to isolate the increase in risk. Replicating a lab study will settle ethics committee's nerves about participant and researcher safety, as the only thing that is changing is the location of the data collection. If debriefing the participant in person to assess their state of mind was an important component of your previous study, they may want you to do a Zoom call while the participant does the study. And this is also quite a good tactic uh, when you're working with kids. I think somebody was asking about that in the chat earlier. The added benefit of starting with a replication is that it's easier for you and allows you to compare data quality and convince your own internal reviewer too that the online data quality and the lab, lab data quality match up. Tip number two, the number one thing that will reduce risk from a data security perspective is anonymizing your data. The big fines that worry universities relate to data breaches and GDPR compliance, and these pertain to identifying data. So once your data is truly anonymous, these requirements no longer apply. There are still ethical considerations, but at least the big legal ones are, are covered off. The question is whether data is really anonymous or pseudonymous. The Information Commissioner's Office here in the UK, the ICO guidance, is that possession is determinative in the overall assessment of whether personal data is anonymized or pseudonymized. What this means is that whether data is anonymous or pseudonymous depends on who is holding it. So this isn't a, a matter of state, it's a matter of state and the environment that it fits within. So, for instance, recruitment IDs are pseudonymous in the hands of the recruitment platform. So Sonar ID in Justin's hand is pseudonymous because he can go and dig into a system and find out who that person is. But in Gorilla's hands, it's completely anonymous because I can't dig into Sonar systems and find out who that person is. So this is good news for using separate suppliers for recruitment and data collection. It adds this Chinese wall between these two processes, adds another layer of security. In order to compromise your data, a motivated intruder would have to breach two separate company systems, both Sona and Gorilla, which makes it even more unlikely. Tip number three, one trick with sensitive data is just not to store it or to at least minimize it. 
for example, in Gorilla, we have a date widget that can be used to get dates of birth. But collecting date of birth increases the risk of re-identification for a participant. So what can you do? In Gorilla, there's a checkbox. You literally, you just check it. And that removes the day from that widget. So you're only collecting month and year of birth. This increases security with very little loss of data, and it much, makes it much harder for the data you collect to lead to re-identification. The same approach can be used with other sensitive data. You, what you can do is you can consider recoding the data that the participant inputs on the fly and only storing what you need for your analysis rather than what the participant has actually entered. And tip number four, if you can't anonymize the data and have to collect sensitive data, then the next best thing you can do is minimize the amount of time that the data is held by third parties. So in other words, you'd collect your data, data in a very short time window, you know, 1,000 participants in an afternoon. And then once you've got it, close that study, download that data to the university machines, and then delete it from the hosting provider. If a participant can re-identify themselves to you by providing you with a participant ID, and then asked to be withdrawn from the study, then it's essential that you can easily de delete that single participant's data. So that's one thing to look out for. Just bear in mind that once it's deleted, it cannot be recovered and it is also removed from our backups. If you want to delete a whole swathe of data, that is possible, you'd have to get in touch with us to do it first. Um, for various reasons, universities like to make sure that uh, no single one person can delete all of that data in one, one go because research data is obviously a valuable resource and they want to make sure that the appropriate people have given sign off. So you do it by getting in contact with us. But other tips on how to do online research successful, successfully, can I suggest that you go to this website, beonlineconference.com. There are 60 plus talks about behavioral science online um, from researchers all over the world. There are people who've done audio, uh, auditory research, research with kids, health research, research on aging population, and all of these talks have great tips from the, on addressing specific questions in that area of research. One pro tip that might save you some time is see if the service provider has standard information sheet written for an ethics committee. This might save you time. We, for instance, have a statement that can be accessed from our due diligence page. This helps researchers pre present their ethics committee with the information that they need in order to be confident that techni technical safety complies with university policy and procedures and that technical data quality is good enough for the research. Right, scenario number four, you've decided what software you want to purchase. How do you get your university to release the grant funds? We've sold Gorilla to hundreds of universities worldwide, and while there is some variation in the process, it's pretty much the same the world overly, over. Finally, a successful global replication. Knowing the process will help you navigate it without ending up with too much on your desk and use university support staff to your advantage. So let's first understand the context. Universities are massive institutions controlling huge budgets. The grant money they receive and the assurance that they hold is subject to following these university policies and procedures. If they don't, then they are in breach of the contracts that they have. When we start a procurement process with a university, it can take between one and six months to jump through all the hoops. It really varies depending on the university. A fundamental tension point is that universities want companies to follow their policies, but departments often aren't willing to pay the fees for companies to demonstrate that they meet all of these policies. Remember that when we're completing all of these forms, just to say what we do, nothing is actually changing on the software. It's just a question of documenting it to say what's happening and signing your name at the bottom to say, this is, this is, what, I, this is what I say we're doing and now you could sue us if, if we're in breach of that. So as an example, I know companies that charge £30,000 as a setup fee to universities. And this, this £30,000 fee allows them to go through a university procurement process. These fees, these fees are justified. If it takes six to 12 months to go through all the university policies and procedures and complex due diligence questionnaires and answer them all, then you need to hire somebody to do that work. In order to, in order to avoid having to charge these huge setup fees, because we know university departments find, find that would find that exorbitant. Our approach is to have standard terms and conditions across all of our clients. Then the university picks up the, the burden of reviewing all of the documents that I mentioned earlier. To make this as easy as possible, we have comprehensive due diligence packs that are easy to review. And Justin showed a couple of, of what they might look like. So now that you know all this, how does it help you? So the first thing with, with university bureaucracy is don't fight it. It's really important that universities know what they're buying. Trust that there, there is a way through it as long as you're using a, a quality service. 
there's an army of staff in legal, finance, information, security and procurement who are there to support you. Have them re review the necessary documents. Your department administrator can put you in touch with the right place to start. And at first glance, university processes appear rigid, but they are designed to support even the most exceptional situations. There will simply be another process for that. My advice is that is to work the process and if you get stuck, to ask to speak to someone who can help you. If you think you'll use the service more than once, consider getting a master services agreement signed by the legal department. That way, the following year, the purchase is already approved by the procurement team. So pro tip, the service you want to use is probably, probably very knowledgeable about your uh, university procurement. They might be able to help you, and it can be useful to provide them with the contact details of your contacts in legal and finance, infosec and accessibility teams, and they can make sure that the right information is presented to them. Make sure you review, uh, make sure you, you, you review and know what you're buy, buying and how you intend to use it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, sorry, the point here is that when you, when you send, um, send information over to, let's say, the legal team or the finance team to review it, make sure that they know what you're buying and how you intend to use it so that they can scale their due diligence appropriately. For instance, if you're planning to use an anonymous recruitment policy, tell them that. It will reduce their GDPR concerns. So to recap today, what I've covered is how to tell if a third party service provider is safe, uh, go through the due diligence checklist, make sure each of these documents exist so that you know you can send them to the support teams, how to ensure the tool you've chosen meets precision and accuracy required. I would suggest that you should use validated tools. There are two papers, there are five, six or seven validated tools, stick with those and you're going to be pretty safe. I've covered how to protect your ethics committee from unnecessary anxiety. We talked about anon anon anonymization and minimization strategies, and then how to use your university bureaucracy to your advantage. Remember, they work for you and they should do a lot of the heavy lifting. You just need to point them in the right direction. And with that, we come to questions. I think I can stop sharing now. So if anybody has any questions, do put them in the chat. Um, and also it's useful for me if you if you can let me know what was your biggest takeaway, what did you need to hear, what uh, is going to shape your research practice as you as you leave this session today on information security uh, and um, ethics. I think it's a really interesting question. I can just see it coming up in the chat a little bit of like, how much do we have to inform participants of all this? And do participants want to read all of this information? Oh my gosh, isn't it quite overwhelming? I find it quite overwhelming just as having to go through all of this. Um, so yeah, that I think that's an interesting one. The, the too long didn't read act. Justin, can you just jump in and say more about that? That sounds fascinating. Yeah, it's just a proposal, but, uh, but yeah, they, they basically determined that Indeed, as someone mentioned in the chat, no one really reads those long terms and conditions when you're installing software. So they, they want to try to make that simpler. Now, if they're actually effective at that, uh, that would we're, we're not sure that hasn't passed, but it's just a proposal at this point. Yeah, I have seen um, some software companies do essentially their own version of that, which is like, here are the terms and conditions. But like in a nutshell, what it says is, because people often ask us and what we write back to, you know, it's like, we own Gorilla, you own everything else, you own all your research data and everything you put in it. And they're like, oh, great, yeah, yeah, that's fine then. <laughs> it's like, can, can you force me to publish it? It's like, no, it's yours. It's like, I can't force you to do anything. Um, so that's really good. So um, Marcus, do you want to, what's the best way to go forward from here? Do, do, do you want a discussion between us? Do we, do we, do we, are there more questions from the audience? Well, I think it would be good if, um, if people do ask questions, either by putting something into the chat or putting their hands up. I can see that um, uh, there are some things going into the chat that, uh, that you might want to reflect on. So I think opening it up to the audience as a first step would probably be good. Great. And in particular, I think if people have specific examples perhaps of challenges that they faced or, or questions that they have from their own research that they don't feel that they have a, a satisfactory answer to I think that would be um, that would be helpful because in my experience 
if you've experienced a particular challenge, the chances are someone else has as well, and they're probably thinking the same question. So um, sharing those concrete examples from our own practice would be helpful. So there's a question here from Lauren, just saying, Gorilla question, we don't have an account, but lots of researchers seem able to use Gorilla. Are they accessing you as individuals? And what does that mean in terms of more or less risk of GDPR compliance safety? So people can sign up to Gorilla in uh, either as individuals or as part of a subscription, as part of a university. Um, probably if they're signing up as an individual and doing work that pertains to their university work, I think Nicholas uh, has, and I've spoken about this in the past, they are actually signing up as an agent of the university regardless. So that the, the university might be on the line either way. Um, regardless, our software doesn't change depending on who's using it, right? We, we make it as it is the best we can make it for individuals and for universities. So you can just trust, you could, if you wanted to go, ah, it seems like, you know, UCL, Cambridge, Oxford have got subscri so subscriptions. It's probably, they've probably done the due diligence, it's probably safe. I'm just going to use it as, as, as an individual, but your university might ultimately get uncomfortable with that and go, no, 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 we should go through our own security checks as well and sign them up as a, as a provider. So either with a, with a lab license or a department license. But I think one thing to take away is, is the software doesn't change depending on the basis of the subscription, usually. Hopefully that answers your question, Lauren. Any other questions for Nicholas or Justin or me or any particular research scenarios that you'd like us to help you think through? So, so I think somebody at the beginning said, like, I'm, I know, I'm working with kids or I'm working with disabled disabled pe people with specific disabilities. How does this change things? What could I do differently? Just while we wait for that, um, can I just comment on the, uh, the discussion that's been, I mean, I've put a little bit in the chat on this around uh, how you present consent information. Um, and I think for me, the test is, uh, you know, templates and things like that are very helpful, but for me, the test ultimately is in a given scenario, what, what do you need to provide someone with information about in order for them to make an informed consent decision so for them to be informed and that is a, a function of the investigation of their capacity to understand their level of literacy um, and then on the flip side of that is how do you record their consent and so on so so i think it's um it's quite an open issue i mean obviously you know recs have uh, often have templates and guidance and so on um, but my feeling is always that, and perhaps this is a bit controversial, I don't know, but my feeling is always the researchers should be able to argue, and, I, and you, you touched on this, Joe, actually, in your presentation, that you know, there's always an exception. You know, lots of university policy is written as normally, um, and it's there for a reason, because it's very hard to anticipate all the possible things that could happen. And so my feeling is that they are situations where you might have to have some negotiation with your research ethics committee, but that's completely appropriate, to my mind. You know, so if you go in and say, right, well, the information that's needed is this, but in order to make it actually usable, and I thought that was a good point that, um, uh, sorry, I've lost the question in the chat now. Uh, yes, that Lauren made in the chat. I, th I thought that was a very good point that, you know, it is not informed. I would argue that it's not informed consent if the way that it has to be presented is in such a way that people can't be informed. You know, you've, you kind of failed the test of informed consent. It's just some documentation. So, so to my mind, if they're, you know, if the if the oversight body is saying it must look like this, I think there is a perfectly good ethical justification for a researcher going back and saying, but no, if we present it like this, we will not have met the test of informed consent. Um, and I think you can see that in it's rather more sort of niche area. But uh, if you're dealing with situations, for example, of intellectual disability and you have doubts about whether someone uh, has the capacity to consent, uh, to participate in something. One of the requirements in the, certainly in the UK Mental Capacity Act, is that you must take every possible step to enable them to make the decision. So it's not enough just to say, this is our consent form. Um, oh, and this person didn't have capacity to consent. And so we asked their carer instead, or we asked their, you know, legal representative or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the test actually requires you to, you know, consider the time of day at which you present the information and the format of that information presented. Now, obviously, the Mental Capacity Act is considering that in much broader terms of things like medical procedures and, and things like that. 
but the but the principles that come out through that i think apply not just in that sort of situation of intellectual disability but actually from an ethics standpoint much more broadly mm. and i think it's about saying you know what does someone need to have to be informed yeah so two really practical examples of that in psychological research is working with that i've seen is working with kids and working with deaf people so when you're working with kids often you you need your consent form to be much shorter yep. you can't you you can't go through hundreds of questions they'll get they'll get bored and, and switched off and you won't get any data so it comes to and like really simple questions are you happy to play this game smiley face grumpy face rather than a check box it's like do you understand that you can leave at any time you can just walk away and we'll turn it off yes and that's pro and i think that's what one group did it's like literally two questions are you happy to play it do you understand you can walk away and that is gets the best informed consent you can get from a young child and it's more important to do that than to go to their parent or you could argue it's better to get the informed consent that a child can make than to have a parent consent on their behalf another one was relating to um getting consent from people who are deaf now because um deafness makes it harder to develop uh excellent language skills although many many of them do um and the, and the teaching is not always always there to support them. Uh, reading is particularly hard for people who are deaf. So an easy switch out to make is instead to have auditory consent, um, uh, not auditory consent. Uh, you need it to to be read, but you could again keep the language really really simple, right? And just check it check it off. If you're working with blind participants, sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, then obviously reading something's not going to work, but you could give auditory prompts instead and have people respond with a keyboard whether they consent or whether they don't consent so sometimes there is an intersection between the accessibility needs of your participants and the con and the consent that they can give as well hopefully that that gives a bit of color to the situation i think there was uh, I, there was some interesting things raised uh, i saw sometime in the last year about so there's long been a model of having parental consent and child assent um, and there has been some good writing, although I can't uh, tell you what it is now because I don't have it in mind. Uh, but there was an interesting, an interesting uh, issue identified about whether, in actual fact, it should be a kind of dual consent. So it should be child consent and parental consent. I think there's a need for parental consent because you need to be able to, uh, you know, the researcher needs that uh, protection that you know a, a competent adult has given permission to undertake the research with the child. Um, but that alone should not be enough. Um, and, and assent tends to sort of downplay uh, the agency of the child in that situation. And so a, a strong thing, I, if I can think up the, um, that where the reference was, it was one of my colleagues at UCL um, cited it in the context of an ethics review. And I thought it was a very interesting uh, shift of thinking and quite, I thought, appropriate in, its, in my view, for reflective uh, of where, where things perhaps should be. So that it should be parental and child consent. But as you say, uh, put across in a way that is is completely age appropriate and uh, and capacity appropriate. Joe, you've got a couple of questions in the chat which uh, which you might be able to get to. One from uh, from Emily first, I think, and and then another one from Lauren. And um, I just wanted to say one quick thing, which is that some one part of the challenge here is that historically academics have very much been a kind of you know um, jacks of all trade, if you like, and been expected to have a jobbing knowledge of all of the skills that they need from coding to statistical analysis to experimental design to you know these issues for example and we still have that model but i think people feel increasingly out of their depth because those things are all just becoming more complicated most universities and it's not just in ethics but it, often it's the data teams are situated in library services have real expertise on this and i don't think academics do a good enough job of reaching out to those bits of their university to ask for advice and support and and when you do that my experience is that those people in the library teams, for example, are really delighted to hear from academics who want to make use of um, what they can offer, not least because that then makes it easier for them to, you know, to, to justify their role within the university. Um, and we've worked with our uh, data team, for example, to get our information sheets and consent forms uh, right for, for example, data sharing and in particular open data. And it was an iterative process where we could say what we needed and they could bring the perspective of understanding all of the different um, compliance issues. But, you know, most universities will have that resource in place and you just need to um, to reach out to them. And I think they'll welcome you with open arms. That's also the case with accessibility that we found that the people on that team, they are happy to help. They really want to justify their jobs, but also they really want to be helpful and uh, they can be a great resource and when you have them. 
and it's their core business so they know you know mm. they are the specialists and they can give you that specialist knowledge um so emily has a question about could you comment on work in areas of the world that are in current potential recent war zones emily i you're going to have to give me more context to let to to work out what um what the particular question here is uh, oh, hello yeah. can you hear me yeah, i can Send yeah video um, on if you want so so i guess places where there is instability and that they, you know there has been violence is a place where you wouldn't normally want to send your researchers out but doing the research online is obviously you know, probably safer for you and for the participants so that's a real advantage of doing the online research but then on the flip side you know you're not physically there so you can't really assess the risks whether you might be putting the participants in danger at any point or the information security around it so like how do you go about finding out if there's a place that has a military government are they snooping on everything or if we can we get assurance that well actually that these people are logging in through a vpn so that's fine you know the, these kind of the, the online is a huge advantage in in reaching these places and doing research in them but actually on the flip side well maybe there are risks we need to be aware of and i, I didn't know if there, any of the speakers had experience of that that is, such, that is such an interesting question and not one I do have experience with, but essentially this comes down to one of participants' safety. Can you make sure that your participants are safe while they're taking part in your in your research, they're not, that you're not putting them in danger? Uh, Nicholas, you're, you're my go-to person for thinking about the ethical framework, so why don't you start and then that might give me some ideas. Well, I don't have any personal experience of this. Uh, it's, it's a long way outside of um, the kind of research I do, but um, in reviewing work, we have, you know, I have looked at proposals that have dealt with work in um, refugee camps and things like that. Um, and yeah, it can it can be problematic and it does record. You do have to think about the participant safety and how you do it. And it can be problematic if you have cultural aspects that, um, you know, if, if you wanted to interview a particular subgroup uh, of people who would not normally be on their own or be allowed to be on their own or would not normally be able to give consent to participate in something without someone else providing that but it's actually the someone else you want to interview them about um, these things are extremely difficult um, I'm not providing any useful advice here whatsoever I'm just what, sort of yeah the problem. <laughs> but it what, is um... difficult and I, and I think it has to be it has to be thought about um, and so I suppose part of it might come down to how you advise participants to participate um, which of course assumes you can reach them in the first place um, but you you know you could give very strong direction in terms of you know to make sure they're in a particular place of safety or that they are you know so, so don't for example contact us even on a vpn through an internet cafe or something like you know where you could be observed or you know, there, there might be things one could do on a practical level like that um, and the rest of it i think would be about being extremely clear in the consent and information documentation about the risks to the individual um, and how they could how they could deal with it um, but i suspect those who've worked in this area will have, have far more to say than i can on that because i, I you know in this particular scenario I, i'm approaching this really as an, you know how i would approach it as an ethics reviewer if yeah. i saw this proposal i would ask these questions but i wouldn't necessarily have good answers i'm afraid Emily, one place where you might get some interesting insight that would inform your decisions, if you can't find somebody who's done this before and you're like, okay, that's a framework I can use, is to go and look at journalists who um, report in war zones, because they will have um, guidance on how you how you keep um, sources safe in a war zone, particularly when they're reporting uh, what's, what a government's doing and where that might put a risk to themselves. And it might give you some ideas of what the risks are to start to, to start with that you that you want to, to protect participants and yourself from that's great thank you Sorry. um one of the questions that did actually come up it sort of come up tangentially from lauren's question is what do you do when you've got multiple research groups co co um cooperating across the world which we're increasingly seeing so who who owns the date well how do you how do you allocate out the responsibilities and so i think the first thing we have to be clear on is who owns the data because once you know who owns the data then you know who's going to be sued if there's a problem with the data being breached and that's going to help you 
think through what you should do. So you might, in a global corporation, want to go each of the university, the separate universities are collecting their own data and they own that data in their jurisdiction and therefore that has to comply with local laws. Or it might be that it's one host institution that owns all of the data and then they need to think about the risk that they're taking, the extraterritory risks that they're taking. So I think probably the key question to ask is who owns the data and who's going to get sued and everything else will flow off, off those first two questions. This was in relation to the question about uh, collecting data from around the world. Mm, that... Yeah. So, um, so one way to well, first, universities have a data protection officer. They can probably help with this. Um, so the issue had come up uh, when GDPR started. For example, you have some tiny mom and pop like coffee shop in the U.S. and they have users who found their website and are coming from the EU. Does that coffee shop website need to comply with GDPR? And generally what it says, well, but they're not actually soliciting people from the EU. It, I mean, they're a local coffee shop listing their menu. So because they're not soliciting people who are residing in the EU, they don't really need to comply. Why do they need to comply with something where they're not doing business there? Now, this is a different case because it sounds like uh, in this case, the researchers are soliciting people from various countries for, for research reasons. Um, that would be an interesting one. And I think where the DPO could advise on that. I, I think one is in the informed consent being very clear that, okay, this data will be stored here. You agree to that. And also if you would like it deleted, here's your rights to do so. And here's how to manage that. Um, but but definitely a, a DPO could, could comment on the particular situation and maybe in certain countries, it could be different. It's really difficult to speak broadly about that. Mm -hmm. It, it may come down, I guess, to whether there's uh, whether the collecting organization has a legal personality in the jurisdiction where the data is being collected, because, for example, you could collect data, say, from the US, but, but you know, with, with participants in the US, but where the data controller lives in the in the UK or the EU and the uh, that wouldn't require necessarily compliance with US as I understand it, US data protection law, CCPA or something like that, because it's an individual to a European thing. But yeah. I am not a lawyer, so I could well. Yeah, so, in the, so in the case of CCPA, what they said is you only need to comply once you reach a certain threshold. It was number of users or something like this. So, so basically these small scale things wouldn't need to comply with CCPA anyway. That was done just to not ensnare every little company and it was too much regulation. So. Um, Sometimes that could be the case as well. Uh, in, in fact, a lot of people probably doing research in California who are recruiting people who are in California wouldn't need to comply because their numbers aren't mm -hmm. that high. We have to comply because our numbers are really high. But uh, but yeah, th that could indeed be the case. Just it's too low to, to come into play. Well, I completely agree with you. This is this is exactly the sort of case where I would immediately turn to our data protection team mm -hmm. and say, help. Um, what do we do in this situation? And we do know that a number of universities in the UK have campuses that are in other countries as well. So yeah. exactly. we certainly the advice we've been given is that um, a US university that's testing EU collecting data from the EU, whether that's to be from EU citizens, whether that's stored in the EU or whether that's stored in the US should be compliant with GDPR. Um, and then the lawyers follow this with, we suspect this is an area of mass non-compliance, which I think is probably the case. Um, so a bit like accessibility is a journey and information security is a journey. Some of these new regulations, particularly around data privacy, this is a new and developing area, is, is new and developing. Nobody's got it. People won't have it 100% right. But what you're looking for is to work with people who are striving to get it right, who think that data, data protection and data security and data ownership is important and worth protecting and that participants' rights are important. Um, because you want to be on a journey with somebody who is going to take their responsibilities seriously because that will help you minimize the risks that you face. So what happened in the US and the EU is there was a, uh, a framework called Privacy Shield which was a way for US companies to comply with the GDPR side. There was a ruling in the European Court of Justice known as the Schrems de decision, which basically said that is not strong enough. So we're invalidating that for that purpose. And then they said, however, there's another way around it if you have something called standard contractual clauses, SECs, which if that contract is in place with this very specific wording, then that will be seen by the courts as, as compliant. 
Now there is talk of a new privacy shield replacement. Um, that's no one knows the time frame because it involves governments on both sides and government tends to move slow. But um, this this will probably change again in the next few years, as well as I believe there's some other GDPR clarifications. Oh, I forget, but there's yeah. It's a, it's a constantly changing uh, regulatory uh, environment, uh, that's for sure, and got to keep on top of it. That's yeah. yeah. Just as an indication, I talk to our lawyers every week, <laughs> right? So you can imagine if this is if you're a software developer in a university making research software, um, you they, it's a lot of work to keep on top of all of the all of the legalese that you need to understand in order to make a good product. Like it, it, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's what mm. I can say. Uh, Jill, I'm conscious that we're coming to the end yes. of our time. There's a question in the chat about whether the meeting will be recorded. It has been recorded and it will be circulated to um, those who attended shortly afterwards. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful if you want to go back and uh, uh, digest the material that was presented, some of which was obviously quite, uh, quite rich. Um, but I just wanted on behalf of UKRN to thank all three of our speakers and again for all of you um, for attending. And um, Joe, I don't know if there's a, a mechanism by which if people have follow up questions, they can reach out to you. Um, um, yeah, by all means. Yeah. Follow me on Twitter. Ask me on Twitter any questions that you have. Um, neither Justin or Nicholas are on Twitter, unfortunately. Uh, so I won't be able to field them, but I'll see what I can do. Um, yeah. And uh, any other. Yeah, you can follow Sona Systems on Twitter. Indeed. Um, uh, yeah. So follow me, maybe DM me or, or, or ask a question. I'll see, I'll see if I can help you out. But yes, I know this is a tricky area and I know researchers are doing their best to do the best that they can. Um, and sometimes it's useful just to think through what's at stake and, and what, what's a framework for thinking with it. So always welcome Absolutely. to chat. Yeah. And, and all I would end on is to just reinforce the point that we can, we can share our own experiences. We can learn from each other. We can speak to our library teams and our governance teams and our ethics teams, and they will all be, and, and all of the other um, parts of our institutions and ecosystem that uh, have uh, experience that they can bring to bear on these questions. So I think what today has done is just highlight what there is to think about and what some of the pathways through that might be. Uh, but obviously it's going to be very unique to your own particular research program, but hopefully that has been useful and informative. Thank you again to the speakers and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Have a lovely day, Thank everyone. Much. Thank you. Thanks for the great comments and questions. <laughs>